<laughs> Welcome everybody to day three of our CSDMS natural hazards meeting. We still have bunches of good keynotes, uh, clinics today, um, and so it's like a full day and we'll end the day with panel discussion, which is sort of a new item um, that we'll be doing. Um, I've been looking around and seeing people uh, um, being very engaged and um, enthusiastic at the posters, etc. Thank you for that. Uh, we do have a request to do a little bit of homework um, in the sense that nobody, maybe this is the fault of the clinic leaders who had, were supposed to give out links to surveys at the end of the clinic and have people fill in like what they felt was the good parts and bad parts of these clinics and sort of, um, get some data on how those are done. Um, Lynn has not received very many responses and she sent out to everybody those links. And so we highly encourage people to um, fill those in even now. And then today at the clinics, um, the clinic leaders will um, like prompt you again for their own clinics. So it's my pleasure to introduce now to you our first keynote speaker of the morning, Jenny Sukville. Um, she, the real pronunciation is Sukala, but it's fine. Yeah. You're doing well. You're doing great. I didn't ask. <laughs> That's all right. Um, she, um, when you like look up her profile and uh, try to find um, what her science is all about, you'll find that it's about the Navier-Stokes equation in general and that she works on many topics. And it goes from hazards like volcanoes and the Antarctic ice sheet, and that's, I think, how we met, have met before. Um, but what I loved was that it, it had like this little article um, that said, it's the equation that keeps on giving. And that's how she <laughs> um, frames her work. So, Right, thank you so much for this introduction. So maybe the background story to that quote is that when I started studying physics, um, the department had wrote down four equations and he said, you have five years to learn those once you can explain those to me, you're good. And arrogant as I was at the time, I thought, oh, that can't be this difficult. Turns out I'm still working on the first one, which is the Navier-Stokes equation. <laughs> so the work of our group has um, a slightly different twist than some other research groups you might have seen. We're interested in understanding the fundamental physics that connects a lot of different natural systems. So we're interested in understanding mold phase instabilities and how these can lead to really dramatic changes in the system scale behavior. And we apply this to mainly four different systems. So we have four projects in ice, fire, water, and rock. What you're seeing here is um, the shear margin of an Antarctic ice sheet. So that's uh, the ice picture, and that's the one I will mostly talk about. But we're also interested in understanding volcanic eruptions. That's the picture on the right, where you see Stromboli erupting. And then we're interested in understanding induced seismicity. For example, in Oklahoma, has a lot of earthquakes that come from dumping a lot of wastewater into the subsurface. And finally, the nearshore run-up of coastal hazards like tsunamis and hurricanes. So at first sight, these systems might, be, might look completely different, and obviously they are, but they share a lot of similarities. And I think it is useful to study them jointly um, and try to understand why all of these systems have the common behavior of basically completely changing their dynamics over a very short amount of time. So we are not understanding it in, we're not interested in understanding everything about these systems. We're specifically interested in understanding the extreme shift, the extreme shifts that all of these systems exhibit. So for example, if you think of a volcano, it just sits there happily for thousands and thousands of years. And then within a few seconds, it creates this massive eruptions, gas emission rates change by five, six orders of magnitude. So why, why does that happen? And that happens in not just volcanoes, but it actually happens in most natural systems. So I can think of these as four different systems, or I can think of these as different realization of multiphase instability. So how do I think of an extreme event? I think of it as a system behavior that changes abruptly over multiple orders of magnitude. And the fact that it changes over multiple orders of magnitude, I think, has a lot of information in it. It basically means that we're switching the physics behind it. We're switching the, the governing process from, say, a flow behavior to a slipping behavior or something like that. And I think studying them jointly can help us understand 
can help us create new constraints because they're all different realizations on, on this di the regime diagram of less to more solid and laminar to turbulent flow. In addition, they also have thermal processes being very important. So you can see on this diagram that volcanoes probably exhibit the largest range here. They're also the most difficult to observe. So it's almost impossible to observe the interior workings of a volcano. So I think there is a value in studying systems that are similar but not identical that I can observe better. So for example, you can think about degassing from a sedimentary stack in a marine basin. I get very similar degassing channels that actually look quite similar. They're much, much easier to observe. They're also a little simpler in terms of the physics. There's less sort of thermodynamic coupling to the fluid dynamics behind it. That being said, today I want to present a specific project that I thought was of the most interest to this community, and that's our project in ice dynamics. And ice dynamics, I think, is a really exciting field right now, partly because I think we're really at the forefront of, our of revising our fundamental understanding of ice sheets. And I think that process was started by satellite data like this one. So what you see here is INSA data of um, the speed with which the ice is moving towards the coast. And right away, you notice that this speed distribution looks very counterintuitive. So if I thought of Antarctica as just a huge ice cube, sitting in a warming ocean. I would expect that most of the melting ha happens around the edges. When you look at this map, you see that that's not necessarily true. So look at these red zones, these artery-like flow routes. Those transport ice from the center of Antarctica right to the coast. And those are the ones that we're particularly concerned about when it comes to ice loss, because these so-called ice streams and also the outlet glaciers we have contribute 90% of the mass we lose from Antarctica. So I would argue that this is a process we really need to understand. When you show a map, it's always really difficult to get a sense of scale here. And one thing that's always mind blowing to me when I think about ice specifically in Antarctica is the scale. So here is a zoom into the Cypel Coast, which is one of the fast moving zones, and that's a map of New Hampshire. So these are not small rivers. These are not minor trickles. These are massive state sized chunks of ice that are moving extremely fast. What is so puzzling about these ice streams? The first one is that contrary to glaciers, ice streams are not controlled by bottom topography. So let me remove the data layer that shows the speed and let's look at the subsurface. This is bad elevation from radar for the same zone I just showed you. I bet had I shown you this image before, you wouldn't have guessed where those fast flow routes are because it's just not controlled by topography. That is very puzzling. I have ice moving down a plane and for some reason it channelizes in these very rapidly moving zones that neighbor ridges that are basically stagnant. And take a look at the um, speed scale here at the color scale. This is not a minor change in speed. The blue zone is about a meter per year. The red zone is a thousand meters per year. So I'm changing by three orders of magnitude, which is completely puzzling. The number itself is also puzzling when you think of ice as a fluid, because ice, of course, is very viscous and moves slowly. And you can see this here in a photo that a friend of mine took of an outlet glacier. And he hammered nails into this poor ice sheet here, or this poor ice uh, zone, and came back a year later, and it moved, but it moved basically by a bunch of centimeters, right? So ice is moving generally as a fluid, is moving extremely slow. So a meter per year is reasonable, but how would I get to a thousand meters per year with a fluid this viscous? And of course, the answer to that is it's not the ice, right? It is the subsurface that is creating this movement. So when you look into the subsurface, again, here's a field um, photo, you can see that there's really extreme deformation happening at the base of these um, fast moving zones of ice. So you can see this very intense shear deformation here in the sedimentary layers. And that is really interesting when you think of it from a modeling point of view, because it basically tells us that if we just quote unquote, look at mass momentum for ice, we're solving the wrong equations, right? So in a way, these very fast moving ice zones are a reflection of basal processes, right? So if I want to model these accurately in a, in, in, in a model that I have, I need to think about the subsurface, I need to think about the sedimentary dynamics, and I need to think about meltwater. So that's adding a lot of complexity to our models right there. Now, complex models are great, but um, it's always really helpful, I think, when you have a new puzzling phenomenon to start simple. So let's start simple, and the simplest thing I could come up with is force balance. So here are our streams. The dark gray zone is the slipping portion, so it's not flowing, it's slipping, right? That gives you this enormous speed increase. And it's slipping because the sediments underneath are failing. So sediments are 
have such an interesting material property, right? That in, if I change the water content of sediments, I can get them from being solid to fluid. And that transition happens pretty abruptly, which is really quite unique. So it's a very nonlinear material. And that nonlinearity is really, I think, at the heart of the dynamics that we're observing here. So if I just do a simple force balance of gravity driving the stream and basal resistance acting against it, you will notice that these are not balanced by any stretch. Um, so that could suggest that we are simply in an unstable regime, or it could suggest that we've missed part of the picture. I would argue we've missed part of the picture here, and the picture we've missed is the margins, what I've labeled here as margins, which are basically the zone where you transition from the slipping to the slow-moving ice. So let's add this in. So I have a lateral stress that happens throughout the ice column. And this lateral stress for a steady state would need to balance the difference between the other two integrated over the half width of the stream. You're already noticing that when I think about this lateral stress, it depends on the width and the height because I'm integrating these stresses over those length scales. And that means that this lateral stress will actually depend on what the width and the height are. So let's think about this a little more carefully, because if this margin really plays a critical role in the force dynamics, I will create a lot of shear, and with that I will create a lot of shear heating. That is important because as ice gets warmer, we all know that it gets much weaker, right? That's why ice cream is delicious. It's the perfect mixture between a solid and a fluid. It's not an ice cube, right? It's still frozen, but it's sort of this mushy, delicious um, texture. So what's the simplest thing we could come up with to estimate shear heating? The simplest thing we could do is think of this simply as a crack. The sliding portion would be the crack. And if I do that, I can leverage the classical techniques of fracture mechanics to estimate shear heating analytically. That was our starting point here. And you see that this is the domain we're considering. We're neglecting downstream variability for now, which means we can reduce this basically to a 2D cross section. Because of symmetry, I can cut it in half. In the lower domain, the dots indicate that the ice is now moving towards you. And I have a slipping portion, I have a non-slipping portion, and between that, I have a singularity. Now, the fact that I have a singularity is interesting because singularities are giving basically extreme stress concentrations. Now, I can, end, I can estimate the shear heating if I do a J-integral approach, which is well established in, in earthquake mechanics. We do it a little less, I think, in fluid mechanics. But the basic idea is that you try to integrate how much heating you experience around the singularity. So you assume that all of the heating is due to the singularity. I won't go into the details of this. The bottom line is that this factor J tip, which basically multiplies how much shear heating I have, so that's the key um, factor here. It captures how much I'm forcing the system, depends on the lateral stress. So I can use this to estimate how much lateral stress I get and how much lateral strain I get. And if I then appreciate the fact that ice rheology is very nonlinear, so I can relate the strain rate to the stress itself, but that's not a linear relationship, that's a relationship to third order. What I'll basically find is that the shear heating, which is the tau um, epsilon dot term, scales as width over the height to the fourth power. So you just kind of might be wondering, like, why the heck am I going into this much detail about it? Well, the answer is very simple. Shear heating scales with width to the fourth power. That means if I disturb the width of the stream a tiny little bit, my shear heating in the margin will basically go through the roof right away. And that means my lateral stress will drop significantly. But this lateral stress would now have to take up more of the force balance because I've widened the stream. So I'm actually weakening the term that could give me balance here, right? So this weakening due to the shear heating basically means that I have a positive feedback loop here. If I disturb the width of these streams a teeny tiny bit, I would get a dramatic increase in shear heating, which means I get further weakening of the ice and of the stream, which means I would keep widening and widening and widening. And all of these ice streams should basically eat up all of Antarctica. Well, that's kind of exciting, but eh, it's not what we see, right? So the data doesn't suggest this. Yes, ice streams are variable in width and they're very dynamic, but they don't widen without control, right? So I think the power of a simple analysis like this is you can see that the system could be prone to instability. You also see that this inst instability is not the full story. We've clearly neglected an important process here. So let's do this numerically because it gives us the flexibility to relax some of our assumptions. I think we've appreciated by now that we need both the mechanics and the thermal problem. So we're doing a numerical model here that is simple and just a simple 1D um, Stokes solve. 
And we're going to compare it to field data here for one of these ice streams I talked about, Ben Chadler. And the great thing about this ice stream is we have very detailed speed data across the shear margin. And when you look at the plot here in the center, you see that the speed localizes significantly as you go downstream, right? Which is indicative of physical processes changing. On the right-hand side, you can see our numerical solutions for temperature. And I want to draw your attention to this brownish orangey zone, which is the zone in which ice achieves temperate status, which basically means it's at melting point. Right. So that's very interesting because it basically means that in these shear margins actually start melting the margin at some point. Right. So actually start melting the ice. Let me emphasize that this is not fluid. This is just 1% water in the ice. Right. But that weakens the ice dramatically. And that's an important insight because it means water clearly is an important player here and that water will be generated in the margin. So it's not the same as the water that's generated the, from the frictional heating. It's the, mar it's the marginal water that we care about. So let's integrate that into our model. So now we have a hydrology layer here between the ice and the tail. Why is that consequential? You see that on the right-hand side here. The reason it's consequential is if this water channelizes, and it likely would because I'm inputting a lot of water in a very localized position, namely the margin. The consequence of that is that the yield stress of these sediments will change dramatically because the water changes the pore pressure and the yield stress depends very sensitively on pore pressure, which basically means if I have a channel, I get an increase in the yield stress, which is related to the fact that I'm excavating the water very efficiently in the channel. So the water basically, the, the sediment right next to the channel is very water poor. And that's really interesting because that gives me the opposite effect of what I noticed before, which is that if my width change creates enough water in the margin to alter the hydrology, then I can actually locally increase that strength and that can stabilize my margin. So what's interesting about the water here is it has this dual effect, right? So it destabilizes the stream when you start melting because you get the slippage, because you're weakening the till and the, the, the ice stream starts sliding. But it also later stabilizes the ice motion when it collapses in terms of the hydrological system it forms. And I think that's a really important insight for this system, but maybe more generally is that when we think about feedbacks, I think it's important to think both about the positive and about the negative feedbacks. And that helps us to identify fundamental tipping points in our systems. So what I just said is summarized here in this picture. So we worried about these ice streams basically widening. If they were to widen, we would just dramatically increase the amount of ice we're transporting to the ocean. In the regime where I have a thin water film, I could get slow gradual widening. If I have channels forming in the margin, I would stabilize the margin. So I would have a typical width, and that's actually what we see in Antarctica. Most ice streams have a pretty typical width that correlates nicely with where I would start to see melting in the margin. However, if I go to a lot of water at the subsurface and I get these distributed cavities in the ice planes, things again start changing very significantly because now the ice stream can basically jump from one location to the other. And that is something we actually do see in the data. So here's a very interesting case of an ice stream, which is CAM ice stream. And it suddenly died for some reason that we haven't quite figured out. And we're thinking the water was critical to it, but we're not quite certain. And during the shutdown sequence, the margin jumped. And that's what you see here in the picture. You have margin one, and then you have margin two. And these margins are separated uh, based by a few kilometers, but in the ice record, so in the radar data that you see at the bottom here, which has been used to identify these margin locations, there's no transition between those. You kind of go from one location to the other. So think about that. You have a New Hampshire-sized ice stream that just suddenly shifts location just continuously, which is just mind-blowing to me that that's even possible. However, if you think of it from a water percolation point of view, it's not that surprising because water can definitely reroute on the order of a year. And if the ice just mirrors the position of the water and the yield stress pattern that the water creates, then I can discontinuously shift from one location to the other. And that's something that we see in our model and we can reproduce this behavior in a forward way. So we're not trying to match data. We're trying to, identify, we're trying to use the data to identify fundamental physical feedback loops. And I think that's an interesting lesson, both for this case, but also generally, that I think we can use data more creatively than just validating our model. I think it, sometimes it's really interesting to look at outlier information like this one, because it helps you understand something, some of the more maybe extreme 
dynamic potential in a system. So what does this mean from a modeling point of view and sort of from a more fundamental point of view in terms of extreme processes? What I'm basically arguing here is that meltwater percolation at the scale of individual sediment grains governs ice stream dynamics, which in turn governs ice mass loss from Antarctica. So we've made a link between grains that are 10 to the minus four meters to an ice mass that is thousands of kilometers large, which I think is just a really mind-blowing insight to me just how profoundly, profoundly nonlinear these systems are. So from a modeling point of view, I think what we need, we have a really dramatic multi-scale challenge here. And the way we're approaching that is we have a granular scale model. What you see here is a 3D GPU-based computation that couples the ice motion on top. So the blue zone is where the ice is moving slow. The red zone is where the ice is moving fast. We're only visualizing the sediment grains here. And it has water percolating into this. And then you see this coupling between deformation and pore pressure dynamically emerging from the model. We use that to develop a, a contained set of equations for the subglacial hydrology. So we just take that physical insight and plug it into our ice stream models. Those ice stream models are free boundary problems. So we're trying to solve for the position of these margins rather than imposing them. And we do it based on a hydrological model we have developed at the granular scale. And then we plug those into ice sheet models. And that's something that we started very recently. And we're thinking about these margins basically as boundary layers. We have a boundary layer approach to this where we're just kind of using a different approximation in these very thin shear margins um, and to understand how they couple back to, to the large ice, ice sheet dynamics. And one of the interesting things, for example, here is in this granular skin model, you can actually see the mechanism through which you form these channels, which is basically that the uh, input of meltwater locally increases my porosity because of shear dilation. So I have a lot of shear, so the sediments will tend to dilate. At the same time, I have a lot of meltwater influx in that precise location. And that gives me the feedback I need to create these subglacial channels that we also see at the surface. So there is a lot of evidence, at least significant evidence, that those are real. So let me quickly summarize conclusions from a modeling point of view that I think <clears throat> go beyond this specific um, project is multi-phase interactions at the granular scale can really trigger system scale dynamics, right? So we often parameterize these small scale interactions and that's obviously the only thing you can do if you work with a larger model. But I think it is valuable to think more deeply about what are the dynamic regimes, right? So what are the fundamental different types of behavior I can get out of the granular scale and how would that translate to a fundamental shift in the large scale dynamics? The second insight that we're seeing over and over again in our projects is multi-phase flows is just profoundly nonlinear. So when you take a course in nonlinear systems, you sometimes get introduced to this butterfly effect where you have like, you know, a butterfly changing climate. And I have to admit, as a student, I always thought that was kind of cerebral <laughs> because the truth is, I guess it's possible, but most butterflies don't alter climate, right? So it always seemed a bit, a bit abstract. This project was the first one where I thought like, wow, you know, there is like a bunch of sediment grains in the shear margins of Antarctica that actually could have a dramatic effect on a continental scale, um, which is just surprising. That was the first time I noticed something like this, but it's just interesting just how nonlinear these systems are. And one thing I would encourage you to think about maybe also in your research is what are the positive and the negative feedback loops? I think sometimes we get carried away thinking about instability. And yes, that's super interesting, of course, but the question is, I've started, once I start an instability, will it really propagate forever? Will it really just kind of grow out of bounds? Or is there something at some point that will actually stabilize it? And I think that's something that certainly for Antarctica, I think we need to think more carefully about. And finally, I think data plays multiple different roles. And our challenge here is, I think we don't have necessarily enough data. I would love to get more data from Antarctica and we're actually going and getting some, but still, <laughs> Like, you know, I feel like we're really limited by data. But I think also that means that data should go beyond validation. I think it should, should be, we should maybe think a little bit more about outliers or unusual data sets or things that don't fit the normal picture. And maybe there's an information in that that we've missed. So um, that was obviously the main thing I wanted to talk about. But I just quickly wanted to mention a few ramifications of our work on Antarctica that are not purely on the physical side. And I'll just give a very quick teaser on this because we've worked over the last year very intensely together with stakeholders in debate to think about what are the ramifications of these insights for sea level rise adaptation planning. And this is the Bay Area. It's beautiful. I love it. Sure, what's not to love? But this is also the Bay Area. 
So here you see flooding last year in San Jose. You see um, flooding of the Embarcadero, that's 2013, um, and school closures because of flooding in 2014. So we see flooding events routinely now in the Bay Area, but I don't think we've thought enough about what the consequence of these flood events are. And one of the key insights, I think, from an Arctic ice sheet progress we've made or progress we've made in understanding ice sheets is these ice sheets are very nonlinear, right? Which means that the uncertainty goes through the roof. And there's been an attempt to quantify that. So this is work from the Rising Seas Report in California. And you notice that these are the RCP, are the usual climate models that I guess most of you have seen. And then there's this H++ scenario, which takes into account the, some of the instabilities or profound linearities that we're worried about. I should say that this is not the exact same instability that we've worked on. There are a bunch of instabilities that be, could, could be important for Antarctica. That's a different one, but it's also a very important one. And of course, really what this plot wants to say is that we have this enormous spread of possible flooding. Notice that, say, in 2050, this uncertainty goes from basically a meter of sea level rise, which I think would change the Bay Area as we know it, in a very profound way, to zero. The uncertainty is mind-blowing here. What do we do with that? I would argue we can't wait until we know better because I'm not sure we ever will. There is always this possibility for dramatic instabilities. I think we need to start thinking a little bit more creatively about how we deal with this. So we did a quick analysis of what the risk is and you will notice if you see, so we're we we overlapping hazard exposure vulnerability to get to risk. And you notice on the lo lower left plot that the difference between these two scenarios, RCP versus the H++ scenario, are dramatic. And that's only for the next 20 years, right? So we're not projecting far into the future here at all. And the costs of this will be burdened to the commercial and the residential sector. Obviously, some costs will eventually be publicized, but I think that's interesting. And when you look a little bit more into in the residential sector, who will be affected? You will notice here, so this is a K-means clustering analysis that we did to get a better sense of who will be affected. If you look at the fourth category of rent burdened families, so the label renters isn't a great one, it should really be rent burdened, which means that you spend more than 30% of your income on rent. The renters will be dramatically affected by this, right? So one of the lessons here is I think we could, it, it might be time to think a little bit beyond just limiting physical effects like blood walls, because if you have this much uncertainty, it's difficult to plan a, a flood wall well. To think maybe about interventions that would limit the vulnerability of groups that we now can already anticipate will be heavily affected by this. That's something very much work in progress, but I just wanted to start the discussion about what do we actually do with this kind of information? How does it actually translate to the ground? And I think it can translate to immediate action, but it, not in terms of providing a specific number, but instead of providing more thinking on adaptive solutions, on creating a portfolio of solutions rather than focusing on just a single one. With that, I'd like to thank you and finish on one of my favorite quotes, which says, uncertainty is an uncomfortable position, but certainty is an absurd one. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny, for a great talk. Are there questions? So with my microphone here in the front, so I'll give it to Brad first and then Thank you. Wondering about the, uh, the channelization, is there a component of ice melt involved there? Or is it purely channels getting created in the sediment? An excellent question. That's what we're working on right now. So the classical, so the existing hydrological models we have assume hard rock at the base. So they assume that all of the carving will carve into the ice, right? If you apply those models to the Sipel Coast, which was the region I showed a couple of times, they actually don't work because the creep closure would dominate over the melting that you create. So you basically, you wouldn't create enough melt necessarily to see for the relatively small slopes that we have in this region, right? So those, if you carve into the ice, there's good reason to think that those channels would close. So if I think about this SLR Clisberg and I channel, it's, it's a stretch. So I would argue that most of those channels start carving into the sediments. And that's what we are trying to explore in our granular scan models, right? Because I expect to see, so there are two mechanisms that could give you that. One is the poor pressure related failure of sediments, which basically excavate a channel rapidly right away. You could also do a shear erosion, and that would likely be more important in the actual stream. But I think there is a lot of opportunity to come up with a better subglacial model 
that really takes into account the fact that we have hill, which basically means we have very fine-grained sediments there. So that's like two of my students are working on that right now because I feel like that's a critical piece. So the original model I showed, that assumed carving into the ice, but it's just because that was the only model we had at the time. I don't think that's the right thing to do necessarily. So that was a fantastic talk, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so my question is in regard to the application of this to warm water ice shelves. So, Can you uh, switch the mic a little bit? I have a is that better? Yeah, that's great. Excellent. All right, so my question is how your results relate to warm water ice shelves, because we know from the Larson B collapse that uh, the back stress from Antarctic ice shelves is significant for velocities, and removal of an ice shelf can increase velocities by around 200%. And we're seeing those velocity increases in warm water ice shelves in the Amundsen Sea. So I'm, I'm curious how, um, how these if these results are specific to cold water ice shells or if there's also an application that applies to the warmer ice shells. Excellent question. So right now, our models don't take into account the grounding line dynamics, right? So the grounding line is basically the piece where the ice becomes floating. So it's the transition from land-borne ice to floating ice. Right now, our models just assume you have an infinitely extended ice stream, and we're just kind of looking at, you know, how would that vary in width and speed. Um, right now, one of my students is working on coupling the two, right? Because I entirely agree with you, if you have the collapse of a shelf, you could get a dramatic speed up of the stream behind it, right? And I think one important thing that we're worried about is how would that affect the shear margin? Because you change basically the, the, the uh, the buffering completely, right? So you change the stresses that the shelf provides, which means that you will certainly speed up the flow. The question is, will you also widen the flow dramatically, right? So that's something that we're currently working on, specifically in the context of Thwaites and Pine Island. So we actually have, um, have a field campaign going out to Thwaites to measure the, or to assess the fragility of the margin that separates Pine Island and Thwaites. To, to those of you, maybe just a quick primer, the Amundsen Sea, which is basically Thwaites and Pine Island, are the piece of Antarctica where we're losing the most ice mass right now. And it's also thinning very rapidly. So it seems to suggest that that could be in an unstable state right now. And what we see in paleo data is that these two glaciers were merged once, far in the past. So the question is, for example, if you have system like that where you take out the shelf would you see like a more dramatic collapse event that actually merges these two for example right so what we're working on right now is a linked free boundary model where you couple the grounding line dynamics to the shear margin and to the ice in between but yeah i think that's definitely going to amplify this kind of behavior in a potentially very significant way right so i think we're just at the starting point of really understanding how dramatic some of those nonlinearities are and how those instabilities from the different components of the system can build up to a very dramatic, potentially very dramatic disintegration event. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Jenny. Oh.